everybody. Hey, everybody. Good evening. You know, we're starting here with our very first Tuesday night book club of the Pulp Wood Queens and Timber Guys International Read with our favorite author, Jamie <laughs> Ford. He is a seasoned, seasoned author now. He won our, um, he's won a book of the year and now as his, as our Tuesday, or as our February Valentine, I picked this, this is my Valentine to you, Jamie, oh. I you specifically for this because we have had you coming to Girlfriend Weekend when we were still babies, like you were talking earlier, but we're very proud of you and everybody asks about you all the time. I mean, <laughs> it is like a really big deal to everybody that you're here tonight and we're just thrilled that um you are this is quite a story but uh just to explain to people who will be watching when i post this on our youtube channel jamie first came to my attention but actually from the pulpwood queens mm -hmm. because uh we had had publishers sending us galleys and they sent us an advanced galley for one girlfriend weekend of Hotel on the Corner Bitter and Sweet. And I had eight Pulpwood Queens read it and they emailed me and they go, have you read this guy's book? Yeah. And I go, well, no, I'm still recovering from girlfriend weekend, but maybe I should read it. And that's when I invited you in. That's what brought us to the attention. So publishers, if you're hearing this, if you send out galleys, this is a, a, wonderful way for book clubs to discover you so you may not be sending them out to everybody anymore but i certainly hope you're sending them to me because we would have never well we would have discovered you jamie i mean my gosh your books are all superstars now they're in in the in the celestial sky with this full moon out there but we had you coming and then my co-host had to step down because he got a new job with a really big magazine in new york and so Everybody said to me, ask Jamie to be your co-host. And I was scared. I, I go, you guys, he's too big, you know, and they go, just ask him. And I'll never forget, Jamie, you said yes. And I, I mean, my heart just clunk, you know, I was going, really? I mean, I couldn't hardly believe it. But that was the beginning. And you were our host for many years. And now you're on this wonderful book to film trajectory with uh, Jenna Hager Bush. And uh, so now I wanna hear just from you, what is the story about everything that has happened since this book came out? Oh, it's it's interesting that uh, that you mentioned the film. I mean, my, my first book was optioned. And as you know, a lot of things get optioned and then they sort of go sideways and um, they, they make, a lot of things get optioned and very few things actually get produced. Um, and I've, I've had some, uh, some wonderful experiences with the film option on hotel and I've had some not so great experiences. And so that's, that's this whole other thing. And so I, I'm a little bit jaded, um, when, uh, Jenna wanted to option it. I mean, I was thrilled and delighted, but I didn't get super excited because I, you know, I've, I've, yeah. I've been excited and then sort of let down and, and I think I can only do that once. Um, but you know, she she's with Universal. Universal has uh, you know they have more resources, and it's 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 a night and day difference than the group that optioned ho Hotel. They're who are wonderful people, but um, Universal has bigger budgets. Uh, people with just very uh, relevant experience. <laughs> yeah, and it, and in fact, they they renewed the option today. Um, so they had it they had it for twelve months, and they just renewed it for another twelve. And and oh. that. Gosh, I didn't probably, realize it'd been already 12 months. Wow. I know. Yeah, it was actually optioned before the book was ever published. Um, so Jenna read it like uh in January of 2022. She read a, an advanced reader copy. And and the way Jenna and I uh began talking was about the film. It was it was before she chose it for the Today Show for her for her book club. So and it was funny because like I just got this this call from my film agent saying, you know, Jenna Bush Hager really likes your book and she wants to option it. And I'm like, 
okay, that was not what I was expecting. We were hoping for the Today Show or something like that, <laughs> but I'll take it. Um, right. And so by the time I went on the Today Show, um, a lot of people thought I was very, you know, I was very comfortable. Um, I was super excited, but I had already talked to Jenna a few times before that. So um, I, it wasn't as worrisome as, um, you know, as it might have been if I was just showing up and had never met her. Um, she has a producing partner named Ben Spector. There's a, a woman uh, who's been working on the screenplay for months now. I, ha I haven't seen anything and I, and I probably won't see anything for a while. And again, um, right now, I think all the streaming services are cutting back. They, they, they've hit this ceiling of subscribers in the US and they're having to get subscribers from overseas. And there was this, as soon as COVID, the restrictions were lifted, so many projects went into production. And I think there was a glut of content and now they're sort of paring it back. So it's actually, it's a, it's a, it was wonderful to be optioned, but I think uh, the economic environment right now is making it even more challenging, but they, they re-upped the option. So they're still, you know, they're still fighting the good fight. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. I, I, I feel very confident about this. Everybody's so excited. I mean, we need to get the pulpit Queens rallying, you know, go Jamie, go, go Jamie, go. We're and and honestly, out. you know, the pulpit Queens, you know, we talk about that, that first year that I went, the, the pulpit Queens. And the reason I was an automatic yes, when you wanted me to, to be a host was it really was, it moved the needle for me. It helped my career. Um, there were there were there were groups that were really influential. Um, the it was called Indiebound, which is the, the you know the network of independent booksellers. They they really made a huge difference. Um, when the book came out, Barnes and Noble actually wasn't they weren't crazy about the book. Um, the at the time there was one book buyer for all of adult fiction for Barnes and Noble, and if and she had a lot of power. So if like if she didn't like your cover, you had to change it. Like she could, she could change the title of your book, that kind of stuff. And she just wasn't a big fan. So I didn't have a lot of, it was, the book really was kind of a sleeper hit and um, caught fire through word of mouth. And, and a big part of that is, is Pulp with Queens. And, and I remember going that first time in my, my public. <laughs> you had no idea town? Yeah, it was, it was Je Jefferson, Texas. I'm like, I, okay, I have no idea where I'm going. And I show up and it was the greatest time ever. And that, and that year it was, uh, Pat Conroy was there and- um, Was Fanny uh, Flagg there? No, I think Fanny Flagg was the next year, but, uh, um, oh, who else? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm losing, but it was- John Barrett, was he there? No. Yeah, I, I've been so many times, they've all sort of blended together. I, it's but, 23 it was years, 23 it was years, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was, and it was such a wonderful experience. Plus, Jefferson was just a cool place to be to hold a book event. It was just a a nice, you know, this 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 best kept secret. And I and I remember telling people like, okay, when you go, you have to go to Cooters. That's the one liquor store in town. Everybody goes. To Cooters. Um, and the one diner, the cafe that had the peanut butter pie. And we all stayed um, in Airbnbs, and, and that's how I, I got to know, um, you know, Patty and uh, Ad Hudler, and a bunch of people were there. It was just, for me, as a, a baby puppy author that just didn't know anything, everyone was so kind and fun and um, down to earth. There, no one, there was no uh, literary pretension you know everyone was just hanging out and having a great time and i as a i grew up a poor blue collar kid so it was it was just made me feel so happy it was just it was it was uh real people enjoying books it was cool yeah a lot of people didn't think that we really were reading books, but our <laughs> readers do read the books and they're very vocal about it. So we're really excited. This is, this is, I mean, I, I just have to read one quote mm. that uh, just really struck me because I agreed with every word and it says, um, Sim simply transcendent. Themes oh. of karma, courage, love, and motherhood weave timelessly through eight generations of women 
Seeking to find balance in an increasingly tempest rack world, Jamie Ford has outdone himself. Jamie, um, we need to get you an international off audience. And uh, <laughs> I'm finding out that India is becoming one of my biggest uh, uh, supporters for my YouTube channel. Wow. My, I had one show got 7,000 views from India for my book and film club. Wow, that's and, wild. And, Interestingly enough, one of my little shorts that I put up from Girlfriend Weekend of my son-in-law, Toby, and his brother, Russ, got 299 watches mm -hmm. on YouTube. So the YouTube channel, maybe you need to get a YouTube channel, but uh, I'm picking up my number one audience is now is from India, then the United States, then the UK. Hmm. So I'm watching these analytics. I mean, I'm an old dog learning new tricks and that's oh. what you have to do in this world. So yeah. I, I'm going to do everything people. I can to make sure that I'm going to India. So I'll, <laughs> I'll be sure and tell everybody over there to read your book, but cool. let's, let's talk about this book because this book is touching on something that is kind of been a, a kind of with other authors I've been talking about these, um, you know, these generational traits that get passed on. You know, I was talking about it with author Michael Morris, who's like you, like a brother to me. And the fact that you wrote a book about it in such a way that people can understand, tell, how did that come about? <laughs> That's um, a big, big one there. Uh, quiet desperation, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I was... Um, you know, I had written Hotel, did really well. Uh, Songs of Willow Frost did okay. And then my third book, you know, it, there was they were sort of diminishing. And it puts a lot of pressure on an author um, to perform. And I had, I, I, I was trying all these different things and nothing felt right. And I went to a, an artist retreat in uh, north of Chicago called Ragdale. And I, I showed up with all of these ideas. And there was one that my agent really wanted me to write. And I wasn't crazy about it, but I thought, you know, I need to deliver something. And while I was there, um, there's a, a friend named uh, Megan Steelstra. She's a, an essayist. Um, and she saw me just sort of in this fog. And she said, okay, um, what are you working on? And I told her, and she said, you sound like you absolutely hate that project. And I'm like, mm, I'm not really in love with it. And she's like, okay, put that aside. Just exist in this space for a month. And if the only good that comes of it is you leave and you sort of reset yourself and you have peace of mind, then that's a win. Just take the pressure off. And I really, she was like a big sister. I really listened to her. And so I'm in this room and it's called the blue room. And it's, it's where the founder um, actually died. She died in that room. And I know they, they, call it, they call it the lucky room so it doesn't scare people. But a lot of people have written, a lot of books have, be, have, have begun in that room. Um, the most famous one was uh, Time Traveler's Wife. Oh my gosh. You first began that journey in that room. And so I, I just felt, you know, very blessed to be in that space and I spent my time there and I, I had been fascinated with inherited trauma um, just in general also my own family and I realized I could create this this superstructure of inherited trauma and tell all of these interlinked stories and I wrote an eight-page synopsis um, for for uh, the many daughters of Apong Moy and I left I was very excited and um I showed it to, I, I actually wrote about 80, 90 pages and I showed it to my editor at Random House and they were, they were not fans of it. They, they, did, they, they looked at me like I had lost my damn mind. Um, they, and it, and it, it wasn't necessarily, my, but they, they had a new publisher and Ballantine is still a wonderful imprint. They have my other books and, and great people. They were, this was different than what I had written for them before. And they just, they weren't excited about it. So I, 
um, I, I left and it was the first time I didn't have an editor. I didn't have a publisher or a book contract and became a free agent again. And I ended up at uh, Atria with Simon and Schuster. And I, I ended up with a, you know, an editor that really believed in the book. And now here we are talking. So um, yeah, it's been a journey. Um, it was, it was a roller coaster to get this thing published. You know, Jamie, that that's an incredible story because I think I figured out why everybody wants you to stay on that one same track. It makes their job easier. They don't yeah. have to reinvent the world wheel. They can just, you know, go into that mode and punch in all the little buttons and file it away. And, but what makes it interesting to me is the journey of an author. And that's why, you know, back in Charles Dickens days, they invested in an author like your Atrium um, editor has done. You need to believe in your people. And so when yeah. I pick an author like you, it's, <laughs> All five diamonds in the Pope and Queen Tierra. There's no bad reviews. I tell everybody you can use it. The reviewers <laughs> won't let me review. But um, I and, and and I'm not an expert in, you know, I was an art major and a geology major in college. But, you know, it's just like anything. When you read and read and read like I have, you get an expertise. And you've written and written and written. And now you have an expertise to stick with your own guns and Tell me about your family. Were they supportive on this? Oh yeah, yeah. My my, you know, Alicia. Yeah, my Alicia, wife. she's. Um, I and in fact, the, the book I'm working on currently, just last night, I told her, I'm like, I don't know, I'm I'm, I'm not sure if this is what I should be working on, and and she's always the one that just says, just write it, just you know, just put up blinders, just do what you want to do. Um, she's always supported me, but also she's, she's a great reader. She was one of those kids that like was reading Tom Clancy novels as a third grader. You know, she was just, she, oh she was, she was that kid. And so, and, and then she became a, a night shift nurse. And when she's not delivering babies, she's reading. So she's just read everything. Um, and she's, you know, she, she has good taste, I think. And she's also, well, she, yeah. She's really honest with me. Um, yeah. And sometimes it can be <laughs> a little brutal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's done with love, but I once posted um, some pages because she reads everything first, I, some pages that she had marked up. And I posted it on social media and <laughs> it had comments and, and everyone, everyone looked at it and were like, Oh my God, Jamie's wife took him to the woodshed. Over the <laughs> like, she, like she wrote stuff like, I mean, she writes very complimentary stuff, but then she would write, you know, um, I, I, I'm guessing you wrote this near the end of the day because it's because it's kind of flat. <laughs> I think you're tired. Take a nap. Get back to this part. Um, and I need that honesty. And it's and it's done in a very loving way. It's and um, and it works for me. So when I when I wanted to write this one that was really different and was so worried about it, um, she she had no doubts that's great. At least have none that shared with me. Have, have you seen the film Genius, uh, the story of Thomas Wolf and his editor, Maxwell? Um, he wrote Look Homeward Angel. It was Pat Conroy's favorite author. I've never been able to get through the book. So I thought, well, I'll watch this movie. And the relationship between an editor and the writer. Mm. It's, you know, it's really important with, and I know there's a bunch of authors here and and you, you all know this. I'm preaching to the choir, but my my first book was option or was was bought by uh, a woman named Jane von Marin, and she was the editor on my first two books. And then in the Penguin Random House merger, she got voted off the island, and I, I waited three months. I was going to follow. I don't. I only had a one book deal, so I could leave, and I was going to follow Jane. But she eventually became an agent. And so I couldn't follow her. And I ended up with another editor who is a phenomenal editor. She's just not the right editor for me. Yeah. And I'll ex explain that in a minute. But like the, my third book, the editorial process, we just, we were on different planets. And, and I, it, it was, it was, it was a it was a strenuous process, and so when I 
decided to leave Random House, I was in New York and I went and had dinner with my former editor, Jane, who I adored. And I told her my situation and she said, you know, I know how you work and I know the type of books you write. She said, I, I know this editor and I think she would be perfect for you. Her name's oh, Lindsay wow. Stagnett. And I thought, wow, okay, that's nice. And then when my agent tried to shop this, this book, there was an auction and Lindsay is the one who won the auction. So it was just wow. it was perfect. But also the reason I love Lindsay so much and the reason I struggle with my previous editor is and when I when I told my agent, she's like, what are you what are you looking for an editor? And I said, my editor has to cry at sad movies. Don't <laughs> cry at sad movies. They're going to hate me. I'm going to be too maudlin. I'm going to be too sad. Like, like if they, <laughs> they don't if they don't have a. Uh, if I, you know, an emotional Richter scale that moves, I'm they're they're just it's not going to work. And <laughs> Lindsay is that person. Plus, she's she's very real and unpretentious, and we can talk about anything. Oop, sorry, my wife just came home, so my dogs are. <laughs> um, but my previous editor, we got along great, but I know virtually nothing about her life. Like she oh. was very opaque. And with Lindsay, like we would just talk on the phone for, you know, 30 minutes about the book and then 30 minutes just about our kids and things like that. Yeah. And, yeah. and she was, I, the thing that I, I loved was because a lot of the editors work from home now. So I'm, she has little kids and, and we're going over some edits. And then all of a sudden she's like, oh no, I got to run. My daughter's running around the front yard with a piece of raw chicken. Got to go. Click. And it was like... <laughs> That's real. I love it. <laughs> that is as real as it gets. I relate that's, to that. Um, and, cool. and she's been great to work with ever since. And she's been a great, uh, I, I need someone to modulate the amount of sadness that I could put into a book. Um, Songs of Willow Frost was really dark and heavy. And because I know how my stories are going to end when I write them, no matter how much torment I apply to my characters, it doesn't feel too much because I know it's going to end up in a redemptive place. But I can really, I can really go too far. And and Lindsay pulled me aside and said, with this book, with with daughters, and she said, Jamie, we need to make sure the reader survives the journey. And I was like, oh, oh. oh I know what you're talking about exactly. And I had to, to cut back a few areas. Would you would you say that I you know I I love those kind of books. I mean, I love books that make me feel and have those deep stories. But you know, people that have never had any dysfunction in their life, they hate books that are about You know what I'm saying? They go, "You pick so many." I mean, Oprah got it too. People go, "You pick so many books." I go, "Well, we tend to pick books that we can kind of have something relatable to." It yeah. doesn't matter if they're set in China or India or the United States or Mexico. So, you know, but it's, she's like mentoring. You need a mentor. And yeah. it sounds like she did a great job. I mean, I she's, love the book. I mean, it. It was, it, it was fun working with her, which yeah. I, I haven't been able to say that for a while. It was, it was just, it was an enjoyable experience. Well, um, and for Oh, and, and we edited book. the book and we had never met because of COVID. We, the book was published and we didn't meet until I was in New York on book tour. Um, it was all just via Zoom. So it was great to meet her and give her a hug in person. You'd be surprised how many people are here that I'd never met maybe once before Girlfriend Weekend. But when oh, you sure. meet them, if you're having conversations with them all the time, like book club and stuff, you, I feel like I know my book club members and my authors better than, you know, people I've known my whole life. So you pick your own family. You've picked a great you family, Jamie. You, and you know, you're, tell them where you live too. You oh, know. I live in, I live in Montana. I grew up in the Seattle area. Um, and I, that's most of my family's still there. And I'm, hi, Janet. <laughs> and I, and uh, I'm, you know, that's kind of the home of my heart. So I'm always there. Um, but Montana's, I live in Great Falls. Montana's, it's a small town. Um, it's so funny when after hotel blew up, I would go to the grocery store 
and people are like, you're still here. And I'm like, yes, I <laughs> live here. I, I have children in schools here. And they're like, we thought you would have moved to Brooklyn. And like, like Salman Rushdie is going to roll up with a minivan and open the door like, get in, we're moving to Brooklyn. Oh, um, and it's just, I'm, I'm more of a small town guy. Um, I mean, I just, it's, I, I, I do have a lot of author friends that live in New York, specifically Brooklyn, and there is a writer community. And it's just, it's too much intensity for me, I think. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I crashed the, uh, I wasn't invited to the Brooklyn Book Festival, but I was in town and a friend of mine was there. And he said, there's an author party, just crash it. And I, and I crashed it. And they let me in, which is fine. But the National Book Awards had just come out and all everyone was talking about, they were just like sniping at like, oh, this one shouldn't have won or this one. Or why does that person? And oh, I, I hate I just, that. I don't want to be a part of that. Me either. I was just like, just let people publish the books they want. That's right. People, you know, if, if somebody causes too much drama for me, it's like, eek, I want everything to be love. And the more authors share other people, authors, uh, that cements friendship for life. Yeah. Because when I see authors reviewing other authors, I go, there's <clears throat> somebody I want to invest in as a reader. So I <laughs> am fully invested in you. And so are our book club members. And um, this I feel like we should answer some questions. To, yeah, to, let's open it up. For, for the audience here, from from the and, our friends. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, no, I just, let's do it. I don't know. Sometimes people, and if no one has questions, we'll just keep talking. But. Okay. Well, I know they do. Who's first? Hi, Sarah. Go for it. Hi. I, I'm first generation in Whatcom County. So. Great. <laughs> from the, the same area living mm -hmm. close to the border so um yeah i somehow d have not read your previous novels but i am just captivated by this one and want to congratulate you it's some parts were hard for me because i have family trauma on many different levels many generations and um if it hadn't been for the beautiful lyrical writing, I probably would have stopped, frankly. You know, some of it was tough stuff. And, you know, all the centuries of women being stomped on, but leavened it with that. Um, the, what did you say? Your, um, your editor was modulating the sadness or urging you to modulate the sadness. And I saw in your um, comments in the book that, um, Oh, where am I going with this now? <laughs> I've lost track. Anyway, um, oh, that you, um, you know, you had to put that hope in there. And um, I, I've i tried to do the similar thing only using humor. So I'm wondering, do you ever use humor that way? Um, you know, I, I in, in, when I go on tour, my, my talks are always really funny, which is so strange because my books are, are, are not the same. And I guess I, I take, I don't know, I, I, the, I have written some essays and things that you might consider humorous or they, you know, they make people laugh or, or bring them joy in that way. And people have often asked, like, when are you going to write a funny book? And I, I don't know if I can sustain it for 300 pages. I think you might get sick of my voice or something at that point. I'm, I'm so worried that at some point you're like, okay, I've had enough of this guy. Um, go back to breaking our hearts. Um, and so I'm, I'm a little scared to do that. But, but sometimes it's just the delivery. Um, there was a theater group in Seattle that produced a play of my first book. And... The way the actors delivered some of the lines, they they had all these laugh moments in the play, which I thought were brilliant. And it still had the emotional impact, but the journey was fun. And um it yeah, was great. I actually saw it. I went down to book it and watched it. And uh, because I love the book and the actors were fantastic. I love the yeah. lunch lady. <laughs> they did a they did a great job. I was really pleased. Yeah. And so yeah, it's um I don't know. We'll just we'll just see how it goes. I'm writing a book that, again, I'm I, I'm writing. I always end up writing about something kind of heavy, 
And there is a part of me that that really just wants to write, uh, you know, a, a Colleen Hoover type of romance, you know, contemporary that has, you know, a, a little bit of that has more humor and a little bit more sizzle to it. Just because I, I just think those are, I, I like writing in a contemporary, you know, when I'm writing historical fiction, there's so much research. When I'm writing something contemporary, it's it's the, the writing is just uh, it flows uh, better and more quickly, and that always seems like something I should explore. Well, I always remember Pat Conroy. You know, he said, mm. you know, just tell your truth. You know, yeah, don't listen. You know, and look at him. I mean, legend. I mean, and a lot of people thought he is he telling that story again, but every time he would write a new book, I was gone you know so yeah I mean, pat was always processing his trauma and, yep. and pat was the one that said the the greatest gift a writer can ever receive is an unhappy childhood and <laughs> yeah. you know it was christmas morning every day in pat's life growing up um and so you know you, you know i loved pat pat's my idol pat's my you know one of my top one or two writers of all time. Um, in fact, last year I was on a Pat Conroy kick. I read three uh, Pat Conroy biographies and then I read Death of Santini, which I had never read. Um, yeah. So it sort of got the whole picture of, of Pat's life. Um, yeah, I just, he was, he was, he was the Have real- Have you had one. a chance to read Cassandra's Tell Me a Story yet? I did, I read that one, yeah. Oh man, I thought she did a remarkable job and she gave a wonderful speech at um, Girlfriend Weekend this year mm -hmm. on Friday night. So we were, she's just, they're, they were just magic. And so, yeah. and you were a part of it too. So as we move ahead with this new book and this story, I mean, are, are you going to get any rest, Jamie? I see you every once in a while with your red tennis shoes up on a mountain, but I mean, are you getting any kind, you, you know, you're way younger than me, but um, it, it catches up along it, the way. So I've been, I just don't want them to kill you. No, I'm, I'm making sure that I have a life. Like I, I have to, um, I do have some author friends that they write every single day, including Christmas and their birthday and those kind of things. And and I'm I'm just not that guy. I I need I need recharge time because the things I'm writing are, are in the same way that that Pat wrote. I'm processing stuff, and then I just need to 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 decompress a little bit. Um, and that's usually where I, I end up, you know, doing a lot of book travel and visit, visiting schools and things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, even uh, not this weekend, but next weekend, we're going away to a Forest Service cabin for five days. Oh. We'll have no internet, no cell service, no electricity. There's a wood stove and there's uh, propane lights and you have to ski in to get to the place. Um, so I do. We, we we get away once in a while. That I, is awesome. Have you been to all the 50 states now? I mean, they I, have I you have. everywhere. Yeah. yeah I, are I, you going back to Memphis? Um, I think I'm going back at the end of March. So I'll, I'll fly into Memphis and then drive to Tupelo, uh, Mississippi. Yeah. So yeah, I, I... Oh, that's right. It was Tupelo that you were going to yeah. be doing that. But Memphis that. got hit with that ice storm. So they just had to cancel it. And and rightly so. I was And I was fine with it. I was I was actually the one person... They had us... They turned the, around the plane and they said, don't leave the airport. Um, and I looked at the weather and I left the airport. And everyone else got back on the plane and got stranded in Denver. So I was really happy to sleep in my own bed that night and just let it be postponed. I think yeah. Carol has her hand up for a question. Carol! Hi, Carol. Hi, Carol. Hi I'm loving this conversation, Kathy and Jamie, so thanks so much. <laughs> um, I have a question. As a novelist who also has written characters that um, their experiences are not my own lived experiences, and so therefore... The research is so important and mm -hmm. I'm curious um, and for me, for instance, I really had to research disability mm -hmm. and it's just, you know, um, you have to really get it right and be so respectful and it's nuanced. And so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the ways in which you got really into deep POV mm -hmm. for Afong and um, 
you know, what it was like to grow up as a Chinese woman in that period in which yeah. really, you know, they were, the way you describe it, she was invisible and no rights. And I, I would just love to hear about your process there, and especially because I'm ancestrally, um, even though I was born in the U.S., I'm ancestrally Chinese. And so it's of great interest to me. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, I mean, First, the, the first thing I, 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 is worth mentioning is in the publishing world, there is this, this unspoken vibe. Maybe it's, sometimes it's a spoken vibe for us all to stay in our own lanes. Um, right. And I, I mean, I understand why they, you know, they're, they're, they don't want to run the risk of, of um, kind of what happened to, uh, to Janine's book. Um, um, That's one of our authors, authors too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Appropriation, and, accusations of appropriation. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of, I mean, I have, I have such mixed feelings about that. That's a whole other thing we could talk about, but I really think if you can get out of your lane and then write about someone's, ex, someone else's lived experience and do it so well that the people of that community uh, embrace you, then I think you've performed a great act of empathy. And and you should do that. But if you don't do it well, you're gonna pay the price. And so it's 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 a gamble. And um, I understand why some publishers don't want to take that gamble. For me, writing um, you know, the point of view of six women, um, my second book, Songs of Willow Frost, the you know, the the title character is is a is a Chinese woman. And that was the book where I would I would go into interviews. And like the interview host would say, like, you're a man. And I'm like, sorry, I got a white girl. So can't, can't help it. Um, and that was when I, I got the reputation as like the guy that writes women well. And I, I took that as a, 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 a great compliment because for me, I grew up as a very, I mean, I'm still a super sensitive man. And I, I am, I'm like, I wasn't, my parents, this is, this is the thing I tell people a lot and they understand me when I say this, my parents sent me to poetry camp in the fourth grade. Like I was that kid. And so when, when you're that boy in high school, when everyone else, it's all about how much can you bench press and how far you can throw a football. And I'm like the boy that cries at sad movies and sad books. That's not like a, a strength in high school, but as a writer, it became my superpower. And so being able to get inside someone's head and to feel something deeply and emotionally um, it's finally allowed me to, to take something that I thought was my weakness for most of my life. And it actually was my strength. Yeah. I resonate Good so much. Answer. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Carol. Anybody else have, have a comment or question? Janet or Kathy, I'll let you fight over it. Oh, we can fight. <laughs> yeah. Oh, come or, on. Do you yeah. Okay, my go, book Janet. club, my book club is all retired uh, reading teachers. So we've read all your books. Mm -hmm. And I'm always because of my history background, I even wrote for history language, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I'm always intrigued on in how you find these little details. Like, of course, we love the uh, one about love and other consolation prizes about the baby that was auctioned that really happened at the first successful World Fair in Seattle, I think what 1909, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, you have those little details and then we got really excited because you also brought in the Seattle Fair and so many of us I wasn't living here but most of my people are Washington people and we really enjoyed that but I'm really curious uh, because you have done historic people the Willow Frost that was about the early film industry in Tacoma and that was a real surprise to us it was this is a, this is like a it's the competing city of Seattle Mm -hmm. But uh, Tacoma had a really uh, vibrant uh, film industry, which was, uh, and they, they they did the thing with the uh, totem pole, right? Because that was yeah. something that happened. Mm -hmm. And you can find that vintage of it. But I wondered about, um, you know, um, of Pong Moy, how did you come across her telling her story? Because I know you look for things and like me, I'm curious. It's yeah. Like, I, what is that? I, what would that be like, you know? So how'd you come across her? Um, you know, one of the reasons I'm I'm starting to move, I'm starting to expand a, to not just be known as a writer of historical fiction right. is there are so many of us 
sort of sifting the sand looking for you know uh, clues of the past and and you know i i being someone that's half chinese i sort of vector in on on that world but it's a it's a it's a smaller piece of american history than you know than the the broader picture um i first heard about afong I think in the like the early 90s and it was in a newspaper article celebrating Asian American History Month and it was a full page feature that just had this this timeline and I remember the first entry I think was uh Filipino sailors landed um in the like in in 15 something something 1550 uh landed on the the west coast and then it went all the way up to Christy Yamaguchi winning the gold medal in the Olympics that that year. But in there was a mention and it said, uh, you know, 1834, Afong Moy, the first Chinese woman in America takes the stage. And I never forgot that. And I always, you know, once once we became a, a Google driven world and I could I could Google her and I could try to find newspaper articles about her. Um, I, I always wanted to write about her, but I, I couldn't, there was not a lot known about her life. Um, I mean, there's, I mean, really, there, there just, there, no one knows the true circumstances of how she came here. No one knows what happened to her when she disappeared from the headlines. Um, none of the articles are in her own voice. It's always the voice of the people who promoted her, who monetized her otherness. And I, I try to write stories that have, a beat of redemption and I couldn't find that in her life but I realized by writing about epigenetics I could give her descendants and then her descendants could give her a voice and her descendants could sort of redeem her story and then it all all it all came together yeah we're I think they're looking a lot now too about how things are inherited my great-grandfather was a surgeon at the battle of Gettysburg and uh I've heard stories about him later, you know, the trauma of being a surgeon during all the Civil War battles. But I have found in his journals that he had a great sense of humor and he yeah. sounded like my dad, who my dad never knew. He yeah. was gone by the time my that. dad was born. And I'm beginning to wonder if humor, it's a way of looking at the world because his father was a Presbyterian minister and he was born in 1840. And so by the time he hit the, you know, hit the Gettysburg, he's where he landed as a new, uh, just a doctor out of school, out of Rush Medical. But his humor is, is it sounds like my dad. So I think you can also inherit, it's a way of looking at things that make you have that sense of humor, but also carrying the trauma too of things. We've talked a lot about that with Holocaust survivors. And I've looked at people in the resistance that they've had problems you know you think oh they're the great hero but they have problems and they that could also just center their children how they react to things loud noises or whatever yeah I, I do think you know we always talk about nature versus nurture and you know I I think you know most people believe we're a blend of the two but I'm starting to think there's more there's more nature than we than we want to admit because if we admit that it, it removes an aspect of free will that we have um and and I and I and I understand that too. But in my own family, just you know, I have, I've had those same experiences, right? You just see that reflection or that echo, and it's uncanny. Kathy, do you have a question? Yeah, I what? Which oh, uh, Kathy Ramsberger? Yeah. Okay. You can go, Kathy. Uh, yeah, I you can certainly go. Go, Kathy. <laughs> All There's right, it'll be quick. My questions are usually quick. Um, so I've read your first two, Jamie. I haven't I haven't started this one yet. Um, and I'm wondering, especially because I'm in the middle of my third book, if you feel like each of your books stands alone or if there's a thread or theme that runs through them that connects them all. And maybe this one is the one that you feel might be completely different. I'm not sure. Yeah, this one is. I know I have my viewpoint about what it is in the first two, but oh, sure. Um, yeah, my my first three books—they're all Seattle books. They're all coming of age stories, um, and you know the protagonist 
um, there's there's split narratives. So there's an older version of these characters, but there is a version of the protagonist that's about the same age, about 12, 13 years old, which is I just think that's a wonderful coming of age uh, time. That was it was that was it was it was a big time in my life. You know that that moment where one day you're just thinking about like comic books and recess and then the next bit ba- next day you're just like oh man love sucks i've had my heart broken <laughs> i got first crush or something like that and i think that's really interesting um those three books in my mind are well they really are connected but not really like they, they're standalone books but there is one character that appears in all three books it's a, a doctor named dr luke and he was a real doctor that lived in uh, in Chinatown. And just by, by keeping him, having him have a little moment in every book, it, it, in my mind, it's, those books are all in the same world. Um, and I wrote my first book really thinking I was, um, exploring my dad's childhood, which I, which I was, but by book two or by book three, I realized I'm exploring my own childhood. You know, I'm I'm doing the Pat Conroy thing where I'm just sort of I'm figuring myself out on the page. And then this new book is completely different. And um it's it's historical, but it's also speculative. So it's set in the future. It it really goes in a bunch of different directions. And for me, I I felt constrained by the time I wrote my third book, I really felt boxed in. There was a a box of expectation for my publisher to stay in this box. And I really wanted to do something different. So this is me just sort of like bursting out, trying to, um, you know, do all the things that I want to do in a book all at once and trying to make it work. That's kind of how it came about. It was very freeing. And now I feel like with this next book, it could be be anything now because, um, there isn't the same expectation. Well, congratulations. I um, thank you. Can't wait to read it because it sounds like my kind of book. Cool. I hope you enjoy You're it. You're gonna love it. You're gonna love it. It's amazing. But I just add a, add just a quick note. Um, that same thing happened to me with my publisher after my third novel. They wanted to get this certain kind of writer and. I just said no to it because they didn't like my fourth novel that just went in a total different direction and, you know, different narrative approach. So I really applaud you for following your heart. I, I was considered crazy for dropping out because I didn't find another publisher for a long time. So, but I just couldn't do that. So good for you. Well, it's, it's, you have to write what's in you, not what's in your publisher's mind, you know? Because your name goes on the book, and it's it's a hard to call to make for sure. You made a good call, Jamie Ford. A great call. We're we're really excited. It, it for looks you. that and way did, now. At the time, it looked horrifying. So. <laughs> well, uh, take those risks. I mean, I, if you read the chapter I wrote in his "Our Prince of Scribes," what Pat told me, and I told it in his language, which was not mine, but what he told me has stuck with me all these so that when my next book comes out I'm just tell your truth you know be authentic to yourself it, you know if people didn't like the way they did things you know they shouldn't have done those things to you they might end up being a character in your book but I also feel at the same time that you want to put all the good you can out into the world because there's too much sadness right now you know and we're all struggling. Everybody's struggling. And uh, thank God for Zoom. I, I, I've been struggling with Zoom because sure. Zoom has been um, not working for me correctly. So this is the first time in months that I've had a Zoom go. All right. I was worried there for a minute, but it's going great. And I think I've got it. I've been studying up on it. So just when you think you learn something, they change it up, don't they? Yep. They do. Uh, so, they just um, announced that that Zoom is laying off 1,300 people today. Who did? Oh my God. Zoom. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I have, about, I have a little, another have a little people, this is going to go Alexa. down real fast. 1,300? I saw that and I'm like, 1,300 more people. I'm like, why? Yeah. Technology. Oh, man. Well, you know, if we lose technology now, everybody's so tied to it that I've, 
I'm trying to distance myself a little from it and have a life, right, Jamie? Mm, so right. Um, um, I know that you're going to be doing a lot of things in the future, and I know you're going a lot of places, but what can the Pulpwood Queens do for you? I mean, <laughs> I mean let's do something for Jamie because oh, he's a, you, he's you a have rock done, star. You yeah, have done. He, review yeah. his books, you know. Um, yeah. Jamie, clubs that even if they're not a pulpit queen you got to read this book i mean there's i i, I do everything i can to help these authors because we want to keep you up there as long as we can it's um it's it's our success too to yeah. see you rise this high and we want to be supportive of you so you know it if you need something from me i'm there uh you. the the last thing that i kind of wanted to talk about before you go is first of all you know, we know that your father is Chinese of descent, but tell where your mother's from. This is my <laughs> country, okay? But I, I, I was, I went, I went there two times last year. Um, my mom was from Marshall, Arkansas, which is in the Ozarks. <laughs> um, Marshall is, uh, well, I mean, technically, I say Marshall because no one knows where Whit Springs is. Marshall has a population of about. I don't know, 800. And my mom was from just up the hill. So she was, you know, little bitty. She was in the country more than Marshall. Um, Whit Springs, when my mom lived there, had a population of 250. And now it has a population of about 60. So the wow. town gets smaller and the cemetery gets bigger. Um, but I, yeah, I went back with my cousin last year just to, you know, to tend to the family graves and to see my last uncle and um, kind of go through all the family photo albums and hear his stories. Um, and then I'm so glad we made that trip because uh, about a year later he passed away. And so then I went back for the funeral. Um, but yeah, my mom is from, my, my mom, <laughs> you know, neither of my parents graduated from high school. Um, my mom was very country. She, I, I was asking my uncle, like, what happened when, you know, someone gave birth? And he's like, well, grandpa would get on a horse and he would ride from Whit Springs to Marshall and get the, someone who had a Model T who would go get the doctor and bring the doctor to our house. And, and, you know, that's, that's, that was my mom's upbringing. And then they eventually moved, they sold the farm, moved to California, and they were fruit pickers, like when white people picked fruit, like the grapes of wrath this yeah. okay. to, the, to the West Coast. And then my grandpa got a job at a, a, a sawmill and they planted roots in California. And that's then I was born. Um, so yeah, my it's and my mom was a descendant of Constance Hopkins, who was on the Mayflowers. Oh my God. My my dad and my mom are kind of east east meets west in the United States. I I love these stories because yeah. the more we hear these stories, the more maybe people will be a little. If everybody would look at their own history and mm -hmm. write their story, you know, even if it's nonfiction fiction, you learn so much about yourself when you write, don't you? It's a yeah. it's I call it the poor man psychiatry. <laughs> because I, you know i never could go to, for help so uh it's I, it's just a way of working things out i know? i see i see jeffrey has his yeah jeffrey a, come on jeffrey maybe we can wrap it up on this question oh. I, I know Misha's downstairs i'm gonna join her for yeah. i gotta go make dinner all good, right good to good to make your acquaintance my question is how do you go about creating such beautiful personal dialogue that moves the story along so beautifully Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, hmm. I, this is what I've learned about myself is I do think less is more. And by that, I mean, some books that have a lot of, um, a lot of dialogue on the page. I think that the writer has to be a good actor for those voices to be so distinct. Um, I just finished uh, Daisy Jones and the Six. Oh yeah, which has so many different voices, and and they're they're distinct and much like uh, Lincoln and the Bardo, which has a million voices, and they're all very distinct. And I and I think George Saunders, if he wanted another career, he could be a stage actor because he he inhabits these different characters so well, and and I don't think that's my my strong point, and so I I, I keep it. I, I minimize it a bit 
And by doing that, and by, like, I don't dis- overly describe my characters. And I think by doing that, I, I draw a circle, and then the reader completes the circle with their own imagination. And then that character seems very real to them. And I saw this with my first book where uh, Mrs. Beatty, who's a lunch lady, I don't, dis- I never say her ethnicity, but readers in the South often think she's black and readers in the North think she's white. Um, and oh I don't, my gosh, that's and so, and I say they're both right because they have interpreted that character and that character has come alive in their own context. So anyway, thank you, Jackie. That was a really nice question. Thank you. That was a really nice question. Jamie, if, if there's something you want to leave everybody with tonight, uh, especially <laughs> since we have so many authors, what advice would you have to give after you've gone through this amazing process mm. of all these years? Um, I, I would say this, and I, I don't have evidence that this is going to work out, but this is what I'm doing is, you know, if you have that one book that you really want to write, but it scares you. Uh, because it's either too personal or it feels like it's it's too big or too complex or you know whatever is is scaring you go after that book because it's such an invigorating fear-induced challenge (laughs) Um, I'm doing that now with something I'm like I'm not sure I should be writing this it's very personal and I'm just doing it Um, and I might get halfway through the book and say I, I can't do it but I'm just plugging ahead. And it's that saying about, you know, do something every day that scares you. Um, and there, there's, there's a, you know, there's a risk to that, but I think there's also a, a reward um, in exploring your, you know, your p- potential, whether it's on the page or just emotionally. Fantastic. Well, Jamie, I know advice. Alicia's waiting for dinner. What time is it there in Montana? Uh, it's seven o'clock. Um, okay. I do all the cooking. So I, I made a, I okay. made a really nice, uh, shaved Brussels sprout salad that's calling me. So I'm going to run down there. Well, the, I have last two questions uh, sure. is what do you like to read? And then the last one is when are you meeting with your all men book club still? <laughs> Saturday. I'm hosting. Um, I would love to yeah. jump on board and um, I, it doesn't have to be that one, but I would love to jump on board and do a Zoom sure. with you at one of your guy, all guy book clubs because that speaks volumes to me about getting, we have so many timber guys joining right now yeah. that, you know, we may be girlfriend and boyfriend weekend <laughs> before yeah. long. So yeah. I, will you let me into one of those yeah. at some point? Sure. Okay. Yeah. We, um, in fact, I'm, I finished Lincoln and the Bardo and that was for, for book club. And um, I'm, I'm hosting this time. There's, a, there's about 10 or 11 of us. We've been together for more than 10 years now, which is amazing. And they're just, they're wonderful. And you do it live in a bar, right? No, we, we usually do it at someone's house. Um, oh, okay. Um, once a year, we will, we'll try to find a book where we can sort of do a field trip like we read a book called uh, Lean on Pete by Willie Vlotten, which is set around a, you know, a horse track. And we had our book club at a horse track so we could oh my get God. on horses See, and discuss the I book. This is what I share with people, Jamie. Yeah. Because you're so we, more than just your books. You know, you've got this family. You've got this other thing going. I really, I mean, if it's not, I would love to do that I, they're, this Saturday, they're, I, anytime. They're such, they're really good guys. They're just and you know we're all we have partners or, or are married. We're we're not. We're this is a something guys can hang out and have good good guy time and and not get in trouble. You know, <laughs> end up in a yeah. bar fight or something like that. I've been doing the girl thing here with the guys for twenty three years, but I would love to join that. But so, what are you reading? What do you like to um, read? Boy, um, you know, what I did just you just read that you loved. Oh boy. I, you know, I finished, you know, Daisy Jones and the six, which I loved. Um, Isn't that a Reese Witherspoon pick too? I think so. It's, it's being turned into a show right now. I'm someone sent me this book. It's a book of essays by Brian Doyle called one long river of song. And, you know, sometimes people send me books and I'll just put it aside. I don't have enough time. And this one, I, I finally cracked it open and it's just, they're just such lovely powerful emotional essays about finding the beauty of very small things it's the kind of book that 
understand why she gives it away. She says she's given it away 30 times and, and I'll probably do the same. So What's that's his name again, Brian uh, Doyle. Brian Doyle. Yeah, he he died of brain cancer some time ago, but he is he kind of has a cult following for for writing spiritual books for non-religious people, if that makes any oh, sense. Oh, I've got to read this it's, book. It's I've very it's just it's just like medicine. It is it's, I just find it very moving. So that's what I'm I'm reading at the moment. I'm looking over here. What else do I have? I have a bunch of books for research, which are really boring. So I won't I won't I won't bore you with the details, but like over there is a stack and over there's a stack, and it's stuff, it's stuff for the book I'm working on, and it's it's super dry um academic stuff, but it's kind of what you need to do. It, it's true. Thank you, Jamie. Thank yeah, you thanks. so much. Wonderful Everybody. talk, wonderful uh, insight up. into your writing process. And I wish you all the big book love in the world. Oh, and thank, thank you, you everybody for joining us tonight. This has been recorded. I'll download it. I'll have it up tomorrow morning. I'll send you a copy, Jamie. And um, just thank you so much. And don't forget me on that book club. I want to I want to be the little mouse <laughs> okay. sitting in the room. Give me time so I can read the book, too. You got it. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you for Great coming. talk. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.